Hello, uh, I hope you're having a good week. Uh, I know I've had a great week. The weather has been beautiful, and so I hope you've gotten to enjoy that. I hope you and your family are healthy, and I just want to welcome you. If um, you haven't heard or you still haven't um, been back to church, that's fine. Um, Meta Creek is still going to hold out for uh, a week or two, uh, a couple weeks here, um, but Eller's Chapel and Tuttle's Chapel have began in-person meetings, and so um, don't feel like you have to come, but if you would like to attend an in-person um, uh, service, uh, know that we will be doing uh, at Eller's Chapel at 1020 and Tuttle's Chapel at 1130, both places we're asking everybody to wear a mask. If you don't have a mask, we do have some extras um, just to continue taking precautions. Um, and so we're wearing masks, we're social distancing. I'm not sure how long this is going to have to last, hopefully not long, um, but it's only, you know, for 45 minutes. And so we, it went well last week and so we'll do it again. And as soon as you leave the church, you can take your mask off and don't have to worry about it. Um, so if you want to, or if not, uh, just continue watching these videos. I'll continue to post them every week. Um, but yeah, I hope you've you've had a good week, and, and maybe I will start seeing some of you all again back at church. Um, I want to go ahead and take a moment and just pray with you all. I know a lot is going on um, in our communities. A lot is going on across the country and across the world, and there are, are, are so many things when we just turn on the news, and it can really bog us down, and so we need to be reminded that we have one place to turn um, for help, and that is God, and that is Jesus Christ, and we look to them. We look to them for answers. We look to them for justice. We look to them for love and for hope, um, and just to be guided by them, and so if you want to uh, bow your heads and, and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your true goodness. We thank you for your true justice and your true love. And Lord, that even though none of us deserve it, you sent Jesus to die for each one of us, that we could have a relationship with you and that you could bring life to our lifelessness, that you could bring life to this lifeless world. You make dead people alive. So God, continue just to bring your kingdom. Let us be voices that speak truth. Let us be voices that speak up for justice. Lord, there's so much going on right now, and I, I can't even begin to get into all of it, Lord, but, but you know each circumstance. You know what is plaguing our country. You know what is plaguing our, our communities and our families, Lord, and at the heart of those plagues is sin. And so, God, we ask that you just continue to treat sin with love and the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you forgive us and you forgive our families where we have failed you. Forgive us for our trespasses and our sins. Um, Lord, help us to forgive others. Help us to love and to listen like you did and to speak truth and to be bold. Lord, be with each family and each person that is watching. Lord, I ask that you are with them today. Lord, that you comfort them um, on their very difficult days you are beside them. And Lord, that you can truly touch them um, by the words I say, even if they're in spite, in spite of what I say. Lord, that you still speak to them through your Holy Spirit. Um, and Lord, now we pray the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right, today I'll be speaking out of the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 35, verses 1 through 12. Genesis chapter 35, verses 1 through 12. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree 
that was near Shechem. And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them. So they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar and he called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried under an oak below Bethel. So he called its name Alon Bacchus. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Panoram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offsprings after you. Thanks be to God for his word. I first need to start off today by apologizing. I, <laughs> If anybody has texted me this week and you don't have an iPhone, um, if you have texted me and I haven't replied, I apologize, um, but I haven't had a phone this week. I uh, After church last week, uh, Jessica and I thought it'd be a great idea to go to Pulaski County Park and spend the day at the lake. We did that. We had a great time. I hammocked. I read. I got in the water. We took our dog. We walked the dog. It was great. Uh, early evening, we get home, and I immediately realize my phone is gone. It is too late to go back and look, but um, we have a, a little app that's supposed to tell you where your phone is. We look that up. It says the phone is offline. I tr we try calling it. Um, it goes straight to voicemail, and so we begin to worry that my phone is gone. Uh, the next day, I go back on Monday, I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I talked to the office, and there was no luck. Um, and so I came up with a few theories. Theory one is, I, and this is what I think happened, I think I put my phone on top of the car as I was loading the dog into, into the car and getting the stuff loaded, and when I did that, then I drove off, so who knows where it was, and maybe it it fell off and there was no signal or it fell off and it got crushed and it's unfindable. Or theory two is that it's in the bottom of the lake somewhere. Um, so <laughs> regardless, I didn't have a phone all week. And finally, by uh, uh, Saturday, I had a new phone, but I didn't have one all week. And so if, I, if you text me and I didn't text back, it wasn't intentional. It was because I never received it. Um, but going forward, uh, my number hasn't changed. I got that all transferred over, so that's not a big deal. So I still have the same number. I just want to apologize if if I didn't text back this week. But what losing and not having a phone this week, it really was um, a big reminder. It reminded me <laughs> how much I use my phone. I mean, I use my phone almost all day, every day. From the time I wake up, I grab my phone because it is my alarm clock. It is what I look to for time. It is what I look to to see what the weather is. It is what I work on and look at emails and text people and call people. And it's how I stay connected to the world that I'm on Facebook and on different social medias. And it's how I read the news. And this week, I haven't had that. I, I, I just haven't been able to use it. I've needed a handful of times this week to be able to use my cell phone for directions and I, I go down to use directions and then it's just not there. And so, but, but it's kind of been freeing at the same time. It's been very frustrating, but it's also kind of been freeing. And it's, it's really reminded me that I probably spend way too much time on my phone. Um, and that there is a lot more to me than just having a cell phone in my hands. Um, it was a really interesting week, I'll say that, but it was, it was a reminder. Have you ever needed a, a reminder um, in your life? And I, I know the answer is yes, and, and, and that's why I want to look at this passage today, because I think this passage is a time that God came into, in this case, Jacob's life, and reminded him who he was. But before I really get into the scripture, talking about the scripture we read, I, I think you need a little bit of context. Um, a little bit of context to Jacob's life that got him to the point we read today, okay? And so Jacob is one of the 
three patriarchs, right? You have Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. You know the song, right? So you have Father Abraham, he's the first, and he is who God came to, and God started um, a covenant with him and, and, and a blessing with him, and came and blessed him and told him that he would have descendants that numbered the stars, and that people throughout the entire earth would be blessed because of him, and started this covenant with Abraham, which would set the foundation for the whole Old Testament. The whole Jewish Hebrew uh, people, all of Israel, God's chosen people, really the foundation was started with Abraham. And so then Abraham's son was Isaac, and then Isaac's son was Jacob. And so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are thought to be the three patriarchs, the three um, fathers of the Jewish religion, and, and even our Christian religion, as if because we go all the way back um, to the Old Testament as well. and But Jacob's life really had a rocky start. Um, this picks up in Genesis chapter 27, and we find that, that Jacob is a younger um, brother, uh, that he has a twin brother that it was born first, and his brother's name is Esau. And we, we read that in our, our passage today. Um, but what we learn in chapter 27 is that we start to learn that Jacob's life and Jacob's status, the way Jacob became the third patriarch, was on deception, was on trickery. Um, that Jacob really tricked his, his brother and his father Isaac to not only steal his brother's birthright, but to also steal his brother's blessing. And it's a really interesting story. If you're interested, go back and read chapter Genesis chapter 27. And because Jacob is pretty dis, um, devious, he's he's pretty um, full of deception and, and lies, and and does what he can to get to the top. Um, so much so that Esau really hates Jacob. That Esau wants to kill Jacob and wants nothing to do with him. That's how bad Jacob was. But it's pretty interesting then, because then in chapter twenty eight, Jacob is in this place called Bethel, which we know one day, uh, that we know is the promised land. Um, and Jacob is in this, this land called Bethel, and God comes to him in a dream and begins to bless him, and begins to establish him as the third patriarch, which is really big because I think Jacob had to think, hey, I got this right, I got this position I'm in because I deceived, is God going to honor that? And it appears in chapter 28 that even despite Jacob's deception in his lies, God still chooses to bless him. Even though he probably doesn't deserve it, God still blesses him in the promised land. He tells him, hey, your descendants are going to receive this. This is going to be um, basically giving and passing on the Abrahamic blessing. So Abraham got the promise. Then Isaac got the promise, and then God comes in chapter 28 and gives Jacob the same promise. But then after this, Jacob's life goes very up and down. Um, after this, in the, in the following chapters, he falls in love with a girl, and he goes to her father and says, I'll work seven years if I can marry this girl. He works seven years, and the father says, well, you don't get to marry the girl you love. You get to marry my oldest daughter. And so he marries um, his oldest daughter named Leah. And Jacob's like, but I love the younger daughter, Rachel. And so he says, I'll work seven more years if I can marry her. So instead of working seven years for this girl that he is in love with, he works 14 years and finally gets married and he begins to have children. Um, and if it only stopped there, it would be great, but it doesn't. And so then he begins to have uh, fighting with his in-laws, uh, his father-in-law. There was issues where... Um, Jacob had to take his whole household and all his flocks and run away because he was afraid of his father-in-law. And then he meets back up with Esau, his twin brother, and he is quite afraid. But right before he meets Esau again, he wrestles with God. And this is in Genesis chapter 32. And, and there's this moment in 32 where, where Jacob will not let God and we it, it's kind of hard to understand that chapter. We don't know if he was exactly wrestling with Jesus or wrestling with God himself or a, an angel of God. It, it's really hard to tell, but if you read it in Genesis 32, he wrestles with God. And 
Um, by the end of it, God not only blesses him, but calls him Israel. He says, your name is Jacob, but I give you a new name. I give you the name Israel, giving him really a new identity. And so he has this moment with God. He has this new name, but then he goes and he meets with Esau. And Esau at this point, though, has had kind of a change of heart and kisses him and welcomes him. And Jacob really gets back to his old ways. And, J and Esau really wants Jacob to come with him and, and, and really work uh, and appears um, to have put the past in the past. But Jacob says um, and deceives him once more and, and tells Esau to go this way. And Jacob then goes the other way to get away from him because he is still driven by fear. He's still fearful that his brother is harboring resentment and harboring uh, feelings of anger and hate towards him and is afraid that he would kill not only him but his family and so he deceives his brother once more and his brother goes this way and he goes the other way and then finally before we get to this chapter in chapter 34 um, Jacob's daughter Dinah is raped and taken advantage of and if that wasn't bad enough then um, Jacob's sons are outraged that their sister had been had been raped and Jacob's sons go and they murder not only the people that not only the the man that raped the daughter their sister but they go and kill all the males in the city where this happened and as a kind of revenge for Jacob and Jacob though upon hearing this gets very afraid and very sad because he realizes that them murdering all these men and, and plundering and, and stealing from the city makes Jacob look very bad to the surrounding people, to the surrounding nations and the surrounding cities that he knows if they want to could come and wipe him out. And so he is very afraid and very scared. And then that's where we pick up in chapter 35. In chapter 35, God comes back to to Jacob and tells him what there in verse one he says uh, yeah there in verse one he says arise go up to Bethel and dwell there go up to Bethel and dwell there and Jacob immediately says okay I'm gonna do that and the first thing Jacob does and this is great first thing Jacob does is he gets rid of all the idols he gets rid of all the false worship and the the other gods that his that was in his household he says get rid of them and he gets rid of them and he goes back to the place where God first made the promise, where God first cemented him as the third patriarch, which was Bethel, which is the promised land. God says, go back there. And he goes back there and he builds the altar. And as I was reading this, I have to ask myself, because God then blesses him, gives him the Abrahamic covenant again, and again calls him Israel. But after I, now I have given you that context, this is the second time that God has come and blessed him, giving him the Abrahamic blessing. And it's the second time he has called him Israel. So as I was reading this and looking at the story of Jacob, I began to ask myself, why did this happen a second time? God had already come to him and already said, hey, you're going to be a blessing to the earth. I'm going to give you the promised land. Your descendants are going to extend. You're going to be great. And, he, and then in chapter 32, God comes to him and says, your name is no longer Jacob, it is now Israel. Now we get to 35 and it happens again. And I ask myself, why is this happening? Why does this have to happen? And I think it becomes really clear that Jacob had fallen back into his old self. So yes, God had made him the third patriarch. Yes, God had blessed him. Yes, um, he had given him a new identity and called him Israel. But I think through the ups and the downs and primarily the downs, having to meet with his brother once more and having to go through his daughter being raped and his sons slaughtering all the males of a whole town and then running in fear that that around the next corner, somebody was going to come and wipe out him and his family. That he was driven back into his old way of life. Because you remember, before 
Jacob ever got any promise, before he ever got any new name, what defined Jacob? Deception and fear. And so God comes in and gives him blessing and gives him um, not only blessing, but a new identity. And then what happens? He faces old people and old situations that drive him back to being defined, not by his blessing, not by his new identity, but being driven by fear and deception. And so what is chapter 35 all about? Chapter 35 is all about God coming to Jacob, reminding and reaffirming who God has made Jacob to be. He has come in and saying, Jacob, I need to remind you that you're not run, you're not defined by deception. I need to remind you you're not defined by fear. I need to remind you that you're Israel. I need to remind you that I have this promise for you. And this promise is going to extend from, from your descendants and their descendants and their descendants. And everyone on earth is going to be blessed through you. God didn't give up on Jacob. Did Jacob deserve it? No. Jacob had been so many problems. I mean, he wasn't a great guy. But that didn't change how God responded to him. It didn't change the faithfulness of God. Instead, what it did is it, it really showed God's faithfulness in spite of Jacob's brokenness. That God was faithful to Jacob, protected him, and reminded him who he was. My message for today is, have you forgotten who you were? Have you forgotten what you've done? I was reading a commentary, and this is just a paraphrase, but I was reading a commentary, but it, but it basically said, People that have, people that have basically been in Christ and received a new identity, but have had to face people from the past and had to face problems from the past and had to face circumstances from the past, know all too well what Jacob was going through. That, that know all too well how easy it is from going and be given a new identity from God and how easy it is to slip back into our old broken self. And I think that's true. And so what I want to ask you today is, are you living in your identity in Jesus Christ? Are you living in your old broken self? Have you forgotten what Jesus has done for you? Have you forgotten that Jesus has made you free? Have you forgotten that, that the sin and the burden and the guilt has been lifted off your shoulders and that you're not defined by shame and you're not defined by sin and you're not defined by anything this world can tell you, but you're defined by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that you are defined by the blood of Jesus and that you who were oppressed, you who were enslaved by sin have now been given life. The, the handcuffs have been unlocked. The grave ha has been dug up because you are no longer dead, but now you are alive. Now you are free. And when I look at the story, there were three things that got, that happened to remind Jacob of his identity. And the first thing was in verse two, God rid Jacob's household of false worship, of false worship. And while I would admit today, we don't have, we don't worship little tiny idols, like we don't, we probably, at least most of us, at least I don't think so. We don't have like a stainless steel or a gold or a brass idol that we sit down and worship. But we worship other things. We worship things like money. We worship things like people. We worship jobs and relationships and self and country and political party and hobbies. And I mean, you name it. There are so many things that we worship. And so how do we need to be reminded today of our new identity in Jesus? We need to repent of the things that we have worshipped, the things we've given too much attention to. Maybe it's like a cell phone, where your cell phone, <laughs> my cell phone had become my life. And this week I was reminded, you know what? I don't need a cell phone. My life is not defined by a cell phone. My life is defined by Jesus. And maybe... I've been giving too much attention to my phone and not enough attention to Jesus. What is it in your life that you've been worshiping? 
What is it that you need to just go bury under the tree at Shechem, right? You just need to get rid of it, get out of it, and turn your life to Jesus. That's the first thing. The second thing that happens here is in verses 10, um, 9 and 10, um, he goes, God goes through and, and reminds him of the promises he has already told him. He reminds him that his name's Israel. He reminds him of the Abrahamic promise. What do you need to be reminded today? Do you need to be reminded that it doesn't matter what you've done? It doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter what circumstances you've been. It doesn't matter um, what you've gone through. You are not defined by that. You're not defined by how much money you make or don't make. You're not defined by the color of your skin. You're not defined um, by anything this world tells you you're defined by. But you, as a believer in Jesus, you are defined by Jesus Christ. You are a son and a daughter of the King, and you walk with his authority, and you have been freed, and you can get rid of the guilt, you can get rid of the shame, you can get rid of that sin, and rest in Jesus Christ. Do you need to be reminded today of the promises God has given you? Maybe it's that you need to be reminded that God's with you. On those really tough days, on those days where the world is not fair, on those days where the world is hateful, on the days where the world looks like there is no good, maybe you need to be reminded that God's walking with you. Whatever it is, I, I invite you if, you, if there's something else you need to hear, this book is full of promises. Open it up. Read it. The, uh, the last thing that, it, that happens in this, in this story is that while in chapter 28, um, Jacob receives the promise of Abraham, um, in chapter 35, he receives that same promise mostly, but then as you look into verses 11 and 12, God adds on to that promise. He talks about how kings will come from him, and he, he talks about these other things that aren't in the original promise. And so how does God remind us of our identity not only, do, not only do we need to get rid of false worship, not only do we need to be reminded of promises, but also we need to realize that God will continue to bring understanding and revelation to our lives. That if we are attentive, if we are listening to the Spirit, if we are in His words, if we are coming to worship, then we will get more understanding and God will continue to fulfill and help us understand His promises. So just know that. I hope you are listening. I hope you are looking for his guidance um, because he wants to remind you, you are a child of the living God. You are his child. You are loved. You're guiltless and you're shameless despite of the sin that has been in your life. Jacob didn't deserve it. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But God loves us so much. He is there to reaffirm and remind us of the promise he's given us, that promise in Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your story of Jacob. Lord, continue to teach us, continue to remind us time and time again that you don't give up on us. Remind us of your love, your justice, and your mercy. Lord, thank you for your grace. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I hope you have a good week. Bye.